The October 12, 2018 meeting of the Governance and Policy Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents will now come to order. Um, as you are taking your seats, this appears to be an appropriate time to recognize that today is Sarah Dirksen's birthday. <laughs> Again. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I, I, I assume that in my report, the uh, chair of the board at the board meeting will call for a song or something, but we will dispense with that at this point. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much uh, for uh, attending. We are going to go to item number one. Are we out of order? I think we're going to start with the overview of the board minutes. Am mm -hmm. I correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's correct. All right, so we'll start with the overview of the board minutes, and for that, Jason Langworthy, the Board Associate <coughs> Policy and Committees, will uh, now have the floor. Chair Rocha, members of the committee, good morning. Uh, you'll recall in September we discussed uh, the board's minutes and moving to a, a different format. So this morning, I wanted to give you an overview of the new format and also address some of the questions that came up previously about redundancy measures and, and kind of talk through next steps as, as we move forward. So in the docket, um, your docket for this committee uh, are a set of the draft governance and policy committee um, meeting minutes from last September, uh, as well as the full set of minutes is in the board docket. And what I'm going to do is uh, show you uh, briefly here the, uh, the draft minutes and the new functionality and just walk you through that. So you can see that the, the top portion of the minutes uh, is uh, identical to the previous uh, format. So it has, uh, states the meeting, the time, the location, the regions present, uh, the, the staff, the senior leaders present. Um, and then the first new addition is a link to the docket materials. So if you click on this link, <clears throat> It takes you directly to the docket materials on our website. So that will link right to the, the docket materials. We're unfortunately not able to link directly into an item. So you'll see in the rest of the minutes, we note the page number. But anyone who is looking at the minutes can go directly to the docket materials that are on the website. And these docket materials uh, reflect what was presented. And then after the meeting, we go back and we reconcile. So when there are revised consent reports, re revised presentations, those items, we go back in, we update the docket, and we post the updated docket to the website. So that link will work directly to the updated docket so that it's a complete and full record. Going back over to the minutes, uh, if we scroll down then, each item, uh, you'll see we, we followed our, our previous convention uh, that has the, the chair um, inviting or introducing uh, the other speakers and the title of the agenda item. You can then see the new format. Uh, shows that the docket materials for this item begin on page three. So I could go to the docket materials and, and, and find the exact spot. And then the closed caption video, which means it has a transcript attached to it, is available here. And for each item, this link takes you directly to the moment in time the item starts. So I'll demonstrate. The first item on our agenda this morning is the 2018-2019 committee work plan. If uh, Yesterday is any indication, we'll probably pick up a couple minutes here, so um, we'll turn that over to Executive Director. The other thing you can see on the right side is a full transcript, Chair, and the transcript the tracks the as the video plays. Plan that's been outlined. Uh, this was developed with committee leadership. In addition to the items on today's agenda. The other item I'll note that if you uh, did a, a search, so the, the shortcut is Command F, and let's say we wanted to see when the bylaws were mentioned throughout the transcript in the meeting, we can find 15 different matches and go to those specific points in time within the video. 
So if there's a specific keyword, if you're looking for something, if you want to know, <clears throat> I, I see on the action minutes that they took action on this, but I'm uh, particularly interested in what uh, Regent Anderson had to say about that. Uh, I could figure out uh, exactly with a keyword search, uh, figure out where, where he is or, or where the specific topic is uh, with, within those minutes. So that provides us with a lot of additional functionality. Uh, it allows uh, users, uh, hopefully, to very easily and quickly uh, access and hear exactly what the board said on, on those items. So that's uh, basically an, an overview then of the, the new functionality. And then let me talk through uh, the current redundancy measures that we have in place. Uh, there was quite a bit of interest uh, around those uh, last month. So just to remind you, the board's records include the agenda, minutes, docket materials, and video recordings with transcript. And we also have a, a text file with the transcript uh, that we also maintain, but we load that and link that to the video. Currently, the Office of the Board of Regents maintains an electronic version of all files on a redundant university server, and I'll, I'll walk you through what, what that means. University Archives currently maintains an electronic version on a redundant university server of everything but the video recording and transcript. And that's one of the next steps that we'll work with University Archives to make the video uh, accessible through their Digital Conservancy uh, website. The other thing I'll note is that our friends back in the, in the booth, the, the booth team, also maintain copies of the video as well. So what do we mean by uh, uh, backup servers and, and redundancy measures? So let's say for the September meeting, right, the board's records in the September meeting. So on the OBR side, we store those on a, a shared server. And that shared server uh, is uh, basically has a, a version of those files on server A. And server A also has a second backup file. So server A is always backing up to another server and so that there are two copies of the board's records at that location. At the same time, University Archives is also has their information backed up on server A and an additional backup. <laughs> Just to make sure that we, we don't lose, say, a, a, a server, let's say there's a, a, a water main break in that building, there's an additional server, server B, that also has a, a, a copy of the board's records from that meeting. And again, it's server B, one copy, and then that copy is also being backed up. So basically, to, to bottom line it, there are eight total copies of the board's data on between four to eight servers in two physical locations. Now, the one uh, uh, thing that we, we discovered is that those two locations are both here in the Twin Cities. And so we are working with OIT to ensure that we would also then have some copies backed up to the cloud. So using either Google Drive or Box or potentially having uh, some other files stored at a server on one of our, our other campuses. Um, but for the most part, uh, under, under current practices, there are eight total copies of the board's records. And then just to talk through our, our, our process currently with, with University Archives. So OBR keeps uh, digital records uh, on our server permanently and the board's website for up to 10 years. The physical records are kept in our office for 10 years. We then transfer those physical records over to University Archives. University Archives obtains a copy of digital records roughly quarterly and maintains those records permanently and the physical records are transferred and maintained permanently. We simply don't have the infrastructure to maintain uh, paper copies in archival quality here at the, the board office. So we, we send them over to University Archives. They're stored in the caverns uh, beneath uh, the, the Mississippi River Bluff. Uh, I think next to all of the other artifacts that Indiana Jones has brought to the uh, institution. And, uh, and they, are, they are preserved there. So that, that for us makes sense to have 10 years of, of 
physical copies, but we also will continue to maintain all of the digital records uh, here so we have easy access. And I'll say, having uh, needed to go back into uh, the physical records of the board at times, it's very easy. University Archives is a great partner. They'll simply go down in, into the caverns, pull the records, make a scan, and, and we usually have those within a day or two uh, at the most. So in terms of next steps, uh, uh, unless uh, there's a, a considerable concern, we'll continue with the new minutes format and we'll maintain both an electronic and physical copy of the board's records um, and start to uh, print out uh, everything uh, that the board uh, in, is included in the board's record and maintain those again, the physical for 10 years, the electronic uh, permanently via server. And then we're going to work with the Office of Information Technology and University Archives. We've had some initial conversations and they are very excited to think about how we can ensure that the board's records, including the video, the transcript, the docket materials, are easily accessible, that they are uh, uh, accessible to the public in, in perpetuity. And I, and I think that's a, a big thing. We could easily store the records in, in a vault. Uh, what we are also charged with is to make sure that the public has easy and access to those those records uh, whenever uh, members of the public want to to access it and really thinking a little bit differently <clears throat> with university archives how the board's records are shown in the university's digital conservancy uh, currently there are over 1200 digital files going back to 1889 that are kept by university archives um, those records are usually um, a little separated uh, you know the agenda for one meeting is is one document one kind of file or, or entry in the Digital Conservancy, the document materials might be another. We're working with them to re-envision that and maybe have a page where for any given board meeting, you have all of the committee materials, the video, the agenda, the docket, the minutes, everything is there on, on one web page for easy usability and, and to be able to maintain the, the links across uh, those files. So with that, uh, Chair Rocha, I'm, I'm happy to address uh, any questions. All right. Thank you, and uh, before we open it to questions, um, uh, one, one question that I have, when you talk about the, the uh, ancient uh, records as you were just describing, are those gonna be in a format that's searchable or are they in sort of a PDF or JPEG type uh, format? Sure, that's a, that's a great question, Chair Rosha. The Digital Conservancy right now, it is keyword searchable. Um, it kind of depends on what has been entered in uh, for the keywords for, for that meeting. Uh, but roughly it, it is uh, searchable and uh, all of those files that I mentioned, the 1200, those are digital, so they are uh, normally in PDF versions, uh, some of which are, are scans of, of sort of handwritten uh, items. Uh, others are, are obviously more sophisticated as we move into the present day. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm struck as we talk about this, 30 years ago, we did not have a policy compendium. We didn't have a policy manual. And, and when, uh, when that question was raised about how, we attract, how, how do we identify what a policy is on a certain matter, obviously the main policies were all used frequently and um, at the time Chair Casey appointed a committee uh, with, uh, where I was able to serve with Regent Page and Regent Cooterer and we went through a stack of paper about four feet high <laughs> going through and identifying what actually constitutes a policy and what would be an enabling action and, and so on. But they were just in various filing cabinets around the university the advances that we are seeing now, this capacity to, to search by keyword and have the video as well as the, the, you know, the, uh, the transcript, it, it's, it would have been pretty hard to imagine at that point in time that we'd be advancing this far and I, I'm very impressed with what you have been able to produce here and, and put in front of the board. Um, hopefully I haven't um, you know, tempered anybody's criticism that they were wanting to bring forward by saying that, but I uh, would certainly open it up to questions or comments from the board. Regent Hsu. Thank you, Chair Rocha. <clears throat> uh, regarding telephone meetings, are they gonna be handled the same way, meaning someone's gonna, one person will be here and it'll all be recorded? Mr. Langworthy. Chair Rocha, Regent Hsu, yes. Uh, I believe under, if I'm uh, correct, under open meeting law, you have to have someone in the prime location for the meeting. And so we would at least have one person here. We would live stream, we would record, and uh, certainly the live stream uh, records that audio from, from anyone on, on a phone call. Thank you. 
And Mr. Langworthy, to refresh our memory, when you say one person must be here, that does not have to be a board member, or does it have to be a board member? I'll, I'll phone a friend to, uh, to Executive Director Steves. <laughs> Director Steves. <laughs> Director Steves. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it actually does need to be one member of the body. It has to be in the, the, the location that you have noticed the meeting to be okay. taking place. And so presumably then the, uh, the video would just be that person sitting there for the entire meeting? Is that? That's correct. All right. Correct. So uh, who, whoever draws the short straw, apparently. Um, any other questions? We, uh, we, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Rocha. It, uh, this seems like a voluminous amount of records to keep uh, even digitally if you take a uh, committee like Regent Anderson's yesterday with 280-some pages of docket materials. And so we're going to hang on to those for 10 years in digital format? Mr. Langworthy? Chair Rocha, Regent McMillan, we're actually going to hang on to that in perpetuity. Perpetuity. Do we need a second combined heat and power plant to pay for all that? <laughs> power it? Yeah, wow. Uh, Chair Rocha, Regent McMillan, I, I will say that's one reason why uh, we're keeping files on our website for, for up to 10 years, because that is a lot of, of data load to, to keep on the website. But the Digital Conservancy is, is built to handle that amount of information. And certainly, as we continue going forward, right, the, the size of format uh, of, of files uh, continues to, to shrink and to be more efficient. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the, the video recordings of the meetings are, are under the YouTube label, but um, when we house those clips, they're with us and we're not dependent on YouTube's not going to be around in five years or ten years. And so. Um, what, they're not being how they may be available on YouTube, but that's not how we're depending uh, on to to get the clips themselves. Mr. Langworthy, Chair Rocha, Regent Beeson. So right now, the best public access is via YouTube, but we also have the the actual files of those videos. And that's what we're going to work with OIT and University Archives on is to ensure that we're not reliant on a third party that right. we can host those videos on uh, within the Digital Conservancy. We're just not quite there yet, but thank YouTube you. at least provides us with a good option today. All right, thank you. Will the public at some point be able to do the keyword search as you're describing, or is that something that's only internal? Uh, so that, that functionality that I just showed you, anyone can, can do that uh, with, with a web browser. So uh, anyone can do that right now, and we'll certainly look at designing uh, whatever solution, uh, internal solution, to make sure that, that that functionality continues. Thank you. Further questions or comments from members of the committee? Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Rocha. Um, following along the lines of my telephone question, uh, what about video conferencing? Are those recorded? Mr. Langworthy. Chair Rocha, Regent Shu, anything in, in this room that's a full board meeting is recorded. Um, we haven't really used video conferencing in that way, but certainly in the future, if you had someone that's video conferencing and the booth team maybe switched to them, that would be a part of the recording. As though they were sitting here and the camera panned to them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. M much like in the recording right now when it goes to the, the, the slides. Um, that, that's a part of the recording. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Langworthy. That is an excellent report. We'll uh, move to this uh, second item, which was first in your, in your docket materials. Amendments to the bylaws of the Board of Regents. This is before us for action this month. And I go back to Mr. Langworthy. Thank you, Chair Rocha, members of the committee. Uh, since you reviewed the bylaws in uh, September, uh, we have made two changes uh, to the bylaws to reflect a committee conversation and uh, an item that committee leadership raised. Uh, the first change uh, is to Article 6, Section, section G, Minutes. Uh, and this is on page 11 of your docket materials. And uh, we added, uh, uh, the minutes shall reflect the votes cast in Board of Regents meetings and in committee meetings on matters recommended to the Board of Regents for action. So uh, earlier in that article, uh, there is a requirement that the secretary record the votes uh, that are made by the Board of Regents. Uh, this section on minutes was a little vague on 
uh, recording votes for the board. It, it only mentioned recording votes for committee uh, items that then are voted or, or uh, recommended to the board for action. So we simply added this language to clarify that all votes that are recorded will appear in the minutes. The other item, uh, if you turn to page 12 in your docket materials, uh, and this is in Article 8, Section C, there was some question on the emergency provision language. And uh, previously we had unable to serve, and there was some question of can we get something more uh, definitive uh, to ensure that it's uh, clear that we don't mean unable to serve as an absence or someone is out of the country, but that someone is uh, incapacitated. <clears throat> so you'll see the new language uh, there, uh, and I'll just uh, read this. Uh, in the event of a quorum of the board, as defined by Article 6, Section C, is unable to discharge the powers and duties of their office due to death or incapacity, which is the new language, and it becomes necessary to convene a meeting of the Board of Regents to ensure the continuity of uni university operations. The re remaining regents may convene a meeting and act as follows. Now, uh, clearly, uh, death is, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but in looking at updating language and, and trying to, to pick the, the correct word, we looked at how Minnesota state statutes handles when the governor is unable to serve, uh, and they use the unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office. We then added incapacity, which is uh, and certainly the dictionary definition is physical or mental inability to do something or to manage one's affairs. So uh, in terms of, of of that dictionary definition, it felt like incapacity was the right word. We also asked uh, our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel to look at Minnesota State statute and to see if there is a, a kind of standard legal definition. Uh, they looked at, at different provisions of state statute, including guardianship, power of attorney, custodial trusts, other areas. Uh, and incapacity is defined there as lacking sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate reasonable personal decisions or lacking the ability to manage property and business fairs uh, effectively. So we felt that incapacity uh, strikes the right balance of providing detail uh, to the board to make it very clear that we don't mean absence. We don't mean that someone is unable to be reached because they are out of the country, but because they are physical, physically or mentally uh, unable to do something or to manage one's affairs. Those are the only changes uh, to the bylaws. Uh, I'll quickly mention that there is a resolution in the docket. The resolution is just there to provide um, some some help in, in laying out what will happen uh, if you recommend the changes to the full board uh, later this morning. Uh, the timing between the September and October meetings meant that there were uh, was not 30 days to actually mail the uh, revised document to you. The bylaws also, though, allow uh, the board to suspend provisions of the bylaws. So given the feedback in September uh, and the, the changes we're, we're making here today, if there's comfort to move forward, uh, the motion uh, will be uh, during the committee report first to suspend the 30-day provision and only the 30-day provision of the bylaws and then to take up and vote on the amendments to the bylaws. Both of those actions require a two-thirds vote of the Board of Regents. And with that, Chair Rocha, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. And, and just for clarification, are, are, are we putting this resolution before the committee uh, to, to be recommended then to the full board at this point? So, <clears throat> I, so basically, we, we thought that the resolution, yes, could be could be used to, to create that vehicle. And then during the committee report, uh, you'll be able to uh, make both motions. And, and the resolution that's in front of us on page five, um, does requiring a two-thirds vote to come out of committee to, to make it to the board, or, or it only takes a simple vote to go to the board recommended, and at that point requires the two-thirds? It would be a, a simple majority to, to make the recommendation because the board is actually the, the, the body that is taking the, the full power and requiring that, that two-thirds. So at this, at this point, would, you, would it be appropriate to entertain a motion from a member of the committee to recommend the resolution to the full board? Yes. Okay. Is there, there's a motion uh, to recommend to the full board to pass the resolution uh, on page five of your docket. Is there a second? Seconded by Regent Powell. Thank you. I will now open the floor for a discussion. Regent Johnson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Langworthy, for your uh, work as well as others. I'm always intrigued by, uh, and let me approach it this way, what's the worst case scenario of a situation? And it seems to me when you're talking about incapacitation and ability to perform one's function, are we relying on a, uh, a doctor's opinion? Are we relying on a legal opinion? Are we relying on whoever's opinion? And let's just say we have a very, very divisive issue before us. And a member is not here. Uh, they may be in the hospital, they may be wherever, but they're not here. And my question is, who ultimately is going to decide whether that member is able to cast a vote? And I'm going to answer my own question. It seems to me that in most bodies, it's ultimately up to the membership with advice and counsel from the medical community, legal community. But push comes to shove that we as the other regents or you as the other regents may be casting a decision about my incapacitation uh, would vote, the, you know, the ability to vote. And it could be something very, very uh, contentious. And knowing that uh, uh, Regent Swigum is a patient at, at the hospital and uh, not not being able of sound mind and uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what, Mr. Chairman, see, see where I'm going is this incapacitation definition. I understand the state, you know, the state law, but the uh, culture in which Regent Swigum and myself come come from doesn't necessarily mean the Regent's culture, but it's up it, ultimately to the membership to decide who has the ability to participate and vote. Regent Johnson, I, you, you raise a very good point. I'm going to reframe it a bit because I believe this provision doesn't go to whether you would acknowledge a vote or allow a vote. It has to do with whether the incapacity puts us below what would normally be a quorum for us to be able to operate. But, but your question remains the same, which is how do we determine, you know, who makes the determination of whether there is uh, a, you know, vacancy and incapacity that combines to prevent us from meeting uh, as a board, you know, if there was some sort of natural disaster or something where you would lose a lot of membership. Um, and I don't know if that's a question if, if uh, General Counsel Peterson has a, has a perspective on this or maybe I'll offer Mr. Langworthy an opportunity first and then you know, if you want to. Um, call on others for expertise as to how, how does the law treat this? I, I, I have a, a, a prediction, but I would rather hear from you at this point. Well, General Counsel Peterson moves forward. I, I would agree, uh, Chair Rocha, with, with Regent Johnson that it is certainly up to the, the membership to make the determination. The, the provision is only when a quorum is not available. So first of all, it has to drop below a quorum. Second, it is only to ensure the continuity of university operations. And so it also is to ensure that the university can continue to function. If the university can continue to function, even though there isn't a quorum, then there's no reason to convene, convene a meeting. But certainly and, General Counsel Peterson might have. And again, reframing that, you know, the, the concern, of course, is that, you know, five members of the board in a strategic um, analysis decide that it's to their best interest to meet without uh, other members of the board and, and, and certainly can make the argument that continuity is necessary for their actions. But Mr. Mr. Peterson, could you uh, opine on this? Um, Chair Rocha, thank you. Um, I will answer this question based on instinct rather than research, but um, as Regent Johnson alluded to, um, by passing this bylaw change from my point of view, you would be establishing the standard or the principle against which your actions would be judged. And in the first instance, it, because you are a constitutionally autonomous board, you, uh, you know, by your majority as you deem it at the time, um, would be defining that term. But ultimately, if there were a contested question, it would go to the courts as it often does in issues of incapacity as to whether or not the entity or person with the power to make the decision of the moment has exercised that standard properly. So that would be the ultimate sort of right of appeal, so to speak. And, and Ms. Peterson, I would, would presume that you'd have potentially um, subsequent relief if so action's been taken and you want to contest the validity because people were excluded on this, this basis potentially injunctive relief if you knew somebody was going to act 
seeking the court to stop it on the basis that, that uh, it's not a proper application of the standard? Uh, yes, Chair Rocha. There'd be a number of remedies that a court could impose, including rendering the prior action null and void. Regent Powell. Um, thank you, Chair Rocha. But wouldn't the, wouldn't the determination of incapacity have to be rendered by a medical professional? Mr. Peterson? Um, Chair Rocha, Regent Powell, undoubtedly the medical evidence would need to be of record because the board, particularly anticipating a dispute, would want to kind of lay the groundwork for the basis for its decision. So there'd be a medical component, but as has been alluded to, uh, there may be legal questions that intertwine with that. There may be case law pertinent to um, what standard do you judge that medical evidence against? And there are sort of fine lines in terms of what is incapacity for signing a will, for example, which is a pretty low bar compared to the capacity you need to exercise as a fiduciary of an institution like the University of Minnesota. Those are two different legal tests. So while medical evidence is part of the picture, it is only part of it. Thank you. Um, further questions or comments from the committee? The, the last point that you made, Mr. Peterson, is a very interesting one as to, because you know, again, when you think about it in the, the estate planning context and what the standard is, um, if, there, if there was a simple and non-intrusive way of requesting that the board office have at its disposal, you know, what that standard might be, uh, always nice to have it before you need it if that issue were to ever arise. Um, but that's a very good question, Regent Paul. Questions, further questions or comments with respect to the, uh, the proposed changes to the bylaws? And we have a motion and a second. Hearing no further discussion, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the, of the motion to recommend the resolution on page five to the full board, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. We'll now move to our final item on this morning's agenda. Uh, ethics and responsibilities of the Board of Regents, and for this we're turning to Executive Director and Corporate Secretary Brian Steves and General Counsel Doug Peterson. The floor is yours as, the, as you choose the order. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, today's conversation falls broadly under the, the umbrella of ethics and responsibilities of the Board and, uh, and individual Regents. And um, as we look at, uh, at this conversation, it really it started with the comprehensive review of the board's policy on code of ethics uh, for members of the Board of Regents. That policy, as you know, we have a, a cycle that uh, policy reviews go through and, and this, this policy is up this year for comprehensive review. And so as we started to go down the path of comprehensively reviewing the code of ethics, um, it, it quickly became apparent that it would be helpful to broaden that discussion a bit and talk not only about the role of the Code of Ethics and how it functions with regard to um, the, the Board's activities, but how it interacts with the articulation of the, the roles and responsibilities. And there's another policy that's kind of a companion to it, which is, uh, which is titled Roles and Responsibilities, that uh, we'll look at in, co in concert or in conjunction with this policy because, as I, as I mentioned, they kind of work in tandem. So today's conversation will really be about giving you a little bit of, of depth around what these policies do and, and what, they, what kinds of topics they cover. But then in addition to that, uh, queuing up some, some questions, really to have this be a conversation and a, and a discussion so that as we, as we look at these policies and think about potential changes to them or ways to, uh, ways to better articulate what it is that the, the board wants in terms of its code of ethics and, and, its, and its list of responsibilities, um, we can then take this conversation, go back, make some changes, bring them to you to see if they, they match where you want to be. So that's our goal with today's conversation. And uh, we'll dive right in and start with um, a conversation about fiduciary duties. Now, picking up on the topic that we 
touched on just a few minutes ago. Um, as a general matter, there are four what I would call classes of fiduciary responsibilities. Um, the first two are traditionally the primary set of responsibilities that are highlighted in statutes and in the case law, that is duty of care and duty of loyalty. Um, with duty of care, it tends to fall into two um, categories. Um, the first is that you are engaging in well-informed decision-making. And in that connection, for example, you know whether or not you're relying on reports of, of experienced employees or experts can be taken into account um, in that connection. Uh, a second aspect of the duty of care is whether or not you're engaging in proper oversight and monitoring. Um, for example, whether or not you have an effective compliance program is an is a example of that. Um, with regard to duty of loyalty, that tends to speak to whether or not you're taking um, care to avoid conflicts of interest, whether or not you're honoring the entity's confidentiality obligations, things of that ilk. Um, the duty to act in good faith is referenced in both the for-profit and non-profit statutes in Minnesota, that is for those corporations. It tends to be fleshed out more in case law than it is by statute, and it centers on um, more value judgments as to whether or not you are um, conducting your affairs in an honest and forthright manner with regard to your various constituencies and with regard to your fellow board members. Um, and the final one is duty of obedience, and uh, that obedience term always kind of rubs people uh, a little bit the wrong way. Um, it, it is a duty that's referenced more with nonprofit corporations than it is with for-profit corporations, and my general sense of it is that with a for-profit corporation, there's a hierarchy that tends to ensure um, obedience, if you will, to the law and to the mission of the organization with nonprofit entities, with volunteer boards, et cetera. Um, there's more of a concern as to whether or not particular board members are advancing their own personal agenda as opposed to staying true to the mission of the nonprofit organization that they don't necessarily have as much connection to on a day-to-day -day basis, thus the, the reference to duty to obedience in the nonprofit context. Um, the standards of conduct that are referenced in Minnesota law are of interest in um, one respect that I'd like to highlight. Um, the slide you know, has a couple of uh, uh, references there. But with regard to for-profit corporations in Minnesota, I thought you might be interested to know the breadth of the things that a for-profit board can um, take into account, and it uh, reads, in discharging the duties of the position of a director, a director may, in considering the best interests of the corporation, consider the interests of the corporation's employees, customers, suppliers, and creditors, no surprise there, but it goes on, the economy of the state and the nation, community and societal considerations, and the long-term as well as the short-term interests of the corporation and its shareholders, including the possibility that these interests may be best served by the continued independence of the corporation. So in other words, with a for-profit corporation in the state of Minnesota, a lot of considerations can be taken into account. So transfer that over to your responsibilities as regents of a complex institution that's a land-grant institution accountable to um, ultimately the state of Minnesota, and it sort of reinforces the notion that there are a number of considerations that all of you can take into account as you're determining what's in the best interests of the University of Minnesota. The next slide, um, in some ways, if you wouldn't mind, mm -hmm. Ryan, thank you, um, uh, is, is probably the, um, the heart of the matter in, in many ways um, because 
just to give you some historical context here, from about the late 1980s to around 1990, um, there has been a progression um, in a number of different contexts from what I would characterize as rules themselves to the establishment of compliance programs and to where things are today, which, much, which is much more of a focus on culture of an entity or an institution. Um, so in other words, the University of Minnesota is not unique in terms of the conversation that we're having here. Um, corporations over that time have experienced the regulation of business by, of all things, criminal law. Um, in the late 1980s, primarily due to the savings and loan crisis, um, there were a number of criminal prosecutions of corporations that began, of which you know all of you are kind of now well aware. It led to corporate sentencing guidelines. That led to a 1996 decision called Caremark, um, where the Delaware Chancery Court found that directors and officers had breached their fiduciary duty by not having an effective compliance program consistent with the federal sentencing guidelines. That led to a whole cottage industry of developing compliance activities in, in corporate America. And where that is today is those compliance activities have sort of taken hold such that the corporate conversation is now much more about culture than it is about rules themselves. The legal profession, same thing has happened. We've moved from what used to be a pretty lawyerly discussion of the rules of professional responsibility to what is now today more of a conversation about things like civility, professionalism, um, candor with the court, sort of the values that licensed lawyers should hold and conduct themselves by. Um, so um, the way this has sort of evolved in practice is that um, government entities, you know, in this compliance activities box has seen not only sort of the Department of Justice impose compliance agreements as part of the criminal sentencing process, but you have the SEC um, doing it in the securities context, you have the Office of Inspector General doing it in the context of hospitals and clinics, and as we know, we have OCR doing it in the context of, of Title IX. And where that has evolved is that we've moved to more culture tests of ethics and responsibilities. So it's been um, more organizations asking them questions that are geared toward things like, what is the tone at the top? Um, words like good faith, um, whether or not it's an organization imbued with respect and trust, and there's more conversation about shared governance. And what does the word shared or sharing mean in that context? Um, I'll end by um, a personal experience. A few years before I became general counsel, I was involved in a, but a one month trial in Nicollet County where the centerpiece of the case was Allegation, were allegations of breach of fiduciary duty. Um, the defendants involved a corporation. The president of the company was a licensed lawyer, a board member who was an international governance expert, and the HR director of the corporation who is a former um, uh, public safety chief. And at the conclusion of that case, after hearing about a lot of rules and about uh, a, a lot of conduct, um, the jury, in the end, was focused on values. That's what sort of drove the verdict, and it really um, returned to those, those uh, categories of culture that I talked about. It ended up to be an assessment of the culture of the organization and how um, leadership um, conducted themselves and back to issues like tone at the top, good faith, respect and trust, and shared governance. So those, in, in my view, are the 
sort of the ultimate intangible questions that uh, put a pulse on the question of, of ethics and responsibility. And uh, before we leave this slide, I would just say that uh, I take just a slightly different look at, at, these, at, these, um, at this progression. I think it's less a progression from one end to the other end and that there's kind of, uh, you're, you're evolving as an organization, you kind of end at the culture stage. I look at it, look at it as, um, as, a, as a continuum and, and the fulcrum kind of moves uh, depending on, depending on the, the, the makeup of the organization or the, the people. Um, over time, it changes. Sometimes there is a need for greater clarity around rules and regulations, and other times there is a need for more emphasis on culture. And I think over time it can change. Uh, there can be a time when, you, uh, when you're more, uh, more focused on and, and thinking about uh, cultural and shared values kinds of, of questions, and other times when you need to focus on rules. And so I just look at it that way because I think it's important not to, uh, not to, not to say it's, you're only going one way on this, on this slide. You're only going toward culture. So um, as we look at the Code of Ethics, uh, just to give you a little bit of a grounding, and you get an annual review of the Code of Ethics from the General Counsel. And so uh, we won't go through it in detail, but I'll just touch on as a refresher some of the things that that, that, that policy talks about. It, uh, it starts off with a couple of broad statements around the, the board's responsibilities to uphold public trust and set aside parochial interests and act, in, act uh, for the welfare of the entire university. And then it pretty quickly pivots to some very granular topics around conflicts of interest related to financial, um, financial uh, um, matters and, and investments and then employment conflicts. And it also out, outlines a process for resolving disputes related to conflicts of interest. Uh, it has a provision related to can, candidacy for partisan public office and also requires this annual review. And I think that uh, as, as General Counsel Peterson and I have been talking about it, there's just an unwritten thing that's, that runs throughout this whole policy. You just kind of get, uh, you, as you read it in totality, you get the sense of it. And that is that there's almost a, a front page test. I mean, all of this is set up and designed so that, uh, so that there's not a, a, an issue that, that it lands on the front page that's embarrassing to this board or to the university. And so the idea is really to prevent a situation where there's, uh, where there's a perceived conflict that is, that is not being managed or there's, uh, there's an issue of, that questions the public trust um, or the integrity of the board in some way. And so that's just the unwritten kind of uh, subtext or theme that runs throughout it. As we look at the responsibilities of the board and individual regents, uh, that's the companion policy I mentioned earlier. Uh, it, does, it does several things. It outlines those responsibilities. It, it clusters them into uh, the board's responsibilities as, a, as, a, as an entity and then individual responsibilities. And it really seeks to establish shared expectations for how the board will accomplish its work. And uh, so that, that's, that's the gist of it, and there's certainly lots of text in that policy, and we can, we can talk through any, any part of that. But, um, but General Counsel Peterson also has a nice way to summarize it a little bit. Um, somewhere along the way, I received a card that was a pre-printed card and on one side, it has the responsibilities of the Board of Regents, and in fairly small print, spells them out as um, your policies do, alphabet letters A through L. And then on the back side are the responsibilities of individual regents, and in really small print, it runs from alphabet letters A through P. And I point that out because one of the things you might consider is simplifying them because these um, do um, kind of spell out in a way that's very lengthy and a little bit of a all things to all people way and might sort of lose the heart of the message. And so when I read through these, to me they fall into three classes, which are sort of first, um, your responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis your various constituencies and how you go about staying loyal to the broad mission of this university. Um, second, um, 
how you um, interact with administration, sort of the other fiduciaries, if you will, and it gets to the shared governance question and the line between um, management and, uh, and administration. Um, and then the final class is sort of the relationships between um, each of you, you know, as fellow regents and how you go about um, conducting um, your own business in a way that's on one hand um, collegial and respectful, but on the other hand recognizing that each of you can certainly advance very strongly held views as um, you um, manage this a complex institution. And I would echo that. I think that the, uh, that the policy is a bit wordy. It's long, it's redundant in many places. It has lots of opportunity to be, um, to be streamlined in a way that captures all of the essence of it without maybe nearly as much complexity to it. Uh, as we move on, we'll talk about, uh, talk about remedies. Currently, there is no process in board policy. So neither, neither of these policies, um, certainly the, the Code of Ethics talks about uh, disputes related to conflicts of interest, but doesn't necessarily speak to the conflicts related to or, or adjudication of, of disputes related to maybe a violation of the public trust or a question around uh, parochial interest. Certainly then also uh, the other policy responsibilities of the board and individual regents has, uh, spells out no remedies. There are, there, there are no remedies associated with that. Um, Robert's Rules of Order, which is established by your bylaws as your operating set of rules, does establish a process for adjudicating disputes and it, has, uh, it, it articulates some sanctions that fall into several categories that are, that are listed there. Uh, to my knowledge, the board has not ever chosen to, um, to use those use those uh, those remedies, but uh, but I just bring it up because there's there have been questions sometimes around well how how or what would the board do if if it felt like someone had had not upheld their responsibility as articulated in board policy and so uh, we, we note this now uh, on to discussion questions and this is this is the this is the group participation part of the presentation uh, so We've, ar we've articulated a few. Uh, should the policies, these one or both of these policies articulate specific responsibilities or should they maybe be redrafted to outline a broader set of principles? And really both would be just fine. Uh, it, it just is a matter of which direction the, the group wants to go. Uh, do the policies clearly outline expectations now? And if not, where is greater clarity needed? Uh, should specific remedies be added to the policies? And should the board consider consolidating these two policies into one uh, and perhaps having a more comprehensive policy that, that addresses the, the, the range of topics that these two policies cover right now? And both policies for reference are in your docket materials so that you can reference them uh, easily. Thank you, that completes your initial presentation. Yep. And we will... Uh, move to a conversation among board members. Vice Chair Beeson, please lead us off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to um, acknowledge your leadership and in, um, in, in including this in the work plan. And if I can speak for you, both the chair and I agreed that this should be something more than a cursory review. Um, in my almost 10 years on the board, we've really not looked at this. And obviously the time to look at this policy in any, um, any uh, substantive changes is a time when we, you know, when we don't have something pending. Uh, so I think now is a good time to do that. I don't have specific strong opinions at this point on what sh what else should be in there. Uh, the director has indicated, uh, and the chair, as we were, began talking about this, this, in my opinion, does need a lot of work. Uh, it starts with clarity. In, a, in the in the conversation we had, we began to sort of break apart. There's elements in here that are driven by statute. There's elements that are driven by uh, Robert's Rule of Orders, and there's others by other policies, and we need to be really clear about what all those are. Uh, so um, I think um, um, there's got to be a lot of staff work done to create a framework that we could bring to this committee so that the committee could focus on 
on some of the some of the more sensitive areas. The chair and I talked. There's some pretty, I think, some things that are fairly <coughs> obvious that need to be changed, and there's others that are we're gonna have to really talk through and decide uh, where we want to go with those. But uh, I really uh, like the way we uh, are dealing with this, and I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Rocha, and uh, thank you, Vice Chair Beeson, for that that contextual set of remarks. Because I I agree, this is really important, and I think the conversation that we have um, is really important. And I appreciate the way it's being set up. I think we should have a good conversation now, as a, as a committee and as a board, about what we want an end game to look like. And uh, I'll just speak from experience having served the board as vice chair and chair I think uh, the materials that are on pages what 30 40 and 41 that reflect the uh, subdivision one board responsibility subdivision two regent responsibilities or individuals I think if I was going to take this apart I would want to think about my experience and they're challenging to utilize, interpret, and apply. And I think that comes from a lot of different perspectives. One is many elements here are subject to wildly different interpretations, and that's totally legitimate. Different regions view them differently. And, uh, and then when it comes to applying them, if you want to apply them or we need to apply them, there's no uh, remedies. So I think to the extent, Regents Rocha and Beeson, that you're your plan is to maybe somehow knit together both a, uh, a set of principles that have some degree of common interpretation and then some degree of, and I'm not saying that because you two need to do it, we all need to do it, and the burden is going to fall on staff, but then a linkage to remedies would be, would be great. But again, I practically wonder just how, how feasible that is, how much bandwidth we have, how much bandwidth our staff has. So I don't raise it as though it's a you know a steady problem, but without common interpretive perspectives and without remedies, they're, they sit there and they're, they're, they're a challenge. And uh, when, it, when you're called on by your members to look at them and apply them, they're hard if people don't interpret them and we haven't had a good conversation about what they mean. So. That isn't a loaded statement in any way. It's mostly one to thank you for taking it on. Two to question how far we can go, and uh, and three really, do we want to try and link to remedies, or do we just have the informal linkage that Mr. Steves mentioned about? You know, there's a Roberts Rules remedy that's out there, and and uh, but it's kind of no man's land. No one's ever gone there, and uh, I don't know when or if. Hopefully, we'd never need to. But uh, just some observations and musings from a. Uh, current chair and a past uh, vice chair of the board. One question with all that out on the table, um, Mr. Steves or Council Peterson, perhaps, is there a place where the duties that Council Peterson started his presentation with are, are built into our actual documents? I mean, I think that's a great starting point for this conversation. What are the duties we have at a macro level, loyalty, fiduciary those I don't know if those are in in uh, print anywhere or they're just out there because those are good duties to think about or they're driven by Minnesota law thank you Regent McMillan mr. Steves he mentioned you first and you can certainly uh, uh, tag out if you want mr. chair and Regent McMillan those those duties are not articulated as stated by by general counsel Peterson in board policy right now those are those are kind of widely accepted as, yeah. as duties of of, uh, of corporate directors and leaders, but uh, but they are not articulated directly. I think you could probably read through policies and get the flavor for many of those concepts, but they are not articulated in the same way. Mr. Peterson, you want to take a stab at it? Chair Rocha, to expand on that, um, under your code of ethics in your guiding principles, um, you know you speak kind of broadly in terms of public trust and paramount interest on one hand, and then in the responsibilities of the board and individual regents, we have these long lists. So between the two, you can read these concepts in what is on the page, but as is 
fairly common with organizations. There is not a crisp statement that matches up with the four classes of duties that I referenced. Thank you. Regent McMillan, does that hit your point? Yeah, and I don't know that I'm saying we need that. I just, uh, like Regent Rocha and I were having, well, both of us having law degrees, we tend to get to these points from time to time. We were having a very constructive conversation a couple of weeks ago about the duty of loyalty. It's not one you think about all that often. The way you described it is exactly how Regent Rocha and I were coming at it, which is could a conflict arise even from our processes for uh, for appointing members to subsidiary boards and questions about um, advisory boards and you know opportunities that we all get when the university calls on us to get involved in something. That's not a a duty I think of often. I think about a lot of things, but that's one I don't. So I don't know that I'm asking to see it codified. I am pretty interested in the exercise and the value of it to codify remedies. I think that drives the conversation. It doesn't mean I want to see it or good help, Lord help me, I ever want to apply it. But I do think it drives a very, very good quality discussion. And uh, again, I applaud you for putting and keeping this on the agenda in front of us. Thank you. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. And I also would like to thank um, the chair and the co-chair for elevating um, this issue and bringing it before us. I think it's really important. Um, and there are, um, as Regent Beeson said, there are probably many opportunities, some of them right in front of us, for, to improve uh, and strengthen. Uh, and I also agree with you, it's probably going to be a lot of work. Uh, there's there's a lot that we, we could do here. I wanted to make... Um, a couple of points, uh, a, you know, comment and a question. The first one refers to uh, General Counsel Peterson's comment on, you know, the evolution of thinking in this area, and to, from uh, compliance and rule base to more values and, and tone at the top. And, and, and frankly, just wanted to um, echo uh, and affirm that comment. You know, having lived in the world that I lived in, um, uh, most most of of um, most instances of um, wrong, uh, corporate wrongdoing and corruption, as you read about them today, almost immediately go to um, tone and values, and so that so that's my personal experience, and and so I I, uh, I, I, I listen to your comments very carefully, and so maybe the question is, as we go through this work, um, do we have an opportunity to strengthen and better articulate the core values, you know, of this body, uh, because in my view that. Uh, doing that, I mean that that piece of it belongs on the on the left side of um, uh, corporate secretary Steve's diet. I mean I think values drive compliance and rulemaking and and every, everything else. It trumps almost the values piece almost trumps almost everything. So uh, so that's you know a thought as we as we think about this work. The other the other point is really a question on um, the role and the function. <coughs> Um, of boards versus other kinds of, you know, legislative bodies. And as I thought about this topic and was reading through it last night, I find myself getting confused by, you know, what's the role of a political body, a elected legislature who have rules and governance, many of which are similar, versus a board, which is a smaller group, has a narrower um, Remit, if you will, and is there is there a body of work on how boards should operate and work and remedies versus other bodies that may be more politically oriented? And I, I don't know the answer to that question, but it just I find myself asking, you know, what how are boards supposed to work and what versus larger political bodies? And I I feel that sometimes maybe we get a little confused. Um, so I don't know if there is there is a, a body of work on that topic, General Counsel. Mr. Peterson, um, Chair Rocha, um, Regent Powell, um, a couple of sets of thoughts to offer for your consideration. Um, first, in terms of um, this question, ultimately ending up on a values question, to me is spot on. Um, I do think all of this sort of gets to um, the core mission of the University of Minnesota. And one thing that, you know, other senior leaders and I have talked about that might um, be something that the board could expand on is that as you're assessing sort of the issues of how to 
sort of center your um, responsibility statement on values might be an opportunity to make a statement not so much as for regents of the University of Minnesota, but rather for the university as a whole to sort of set out a gold standard, if you will, of values that should run through this institution top to bottom. So this conversation could be an opportunity to not only sort of reform your own policies, but rather kind of make a statement that's university-wide that could be helpful to drive an ethics conversation that everybody at this university could benefit from um, as we go about our work. Um, second thought, um, in terms of differentiating the fiduciary responsibilities of this type of a public board from, let's say, the responsibilities of a state legislator, um, to me, um, this body is, yes, a public body, but you have what I would call executive branch function. That is, you are running and managing a large organization with a budget. You're um, maybe more in the, tw in the place of 12 people operating as the governor as opposed to the legislature. And I think that kind of helps me sort of determine um, how it is these fiduciary duties come to life, um, particularly on this kind of duty of care realm, because it does drive much more toward how do you effectively manage employees and how do you delegate authority in a way that on one hand carries out your responsibilities of oversight, but on the other hand sort of engenders the trust and confidence that allows people to go forth and, and do your bidding without um, too much management. Regent Powell. Just one quick follow-up, Chair Rocha. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I, pre I appreciate those. Um, one other thought occurred, or I remembered one other thing as you were, as you were speaking, and that's, that, that's a, that captures another dimension of this for me, and that's a comment that Regent Swiggum made a few meeting, meetings ago. Even though we're, a, we're 12 people, we're going to have different opinions, sometimes we may fight you know, and disagree and go after each other, but, but there's a certain way, Regent Swiggum, you said that we, we, we're a team, and somehow we, I think we all would like to work know, as, as a team, which is different from legislative bodies where it's a forum, you know, for hashing out and, you know, disputes. And there's, there's, a, there's a way in which we desire, I think, to operate as a team, recognizing that they're going to be disagreements. And so that's just another thought, you know, maybe on how we, how we think about this as, you know, our function and how we're structured and the executive authority that we have versus other kinds of Thank you, Regent Powell. Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and like my colleagues, thanks to uh, you and uh, Regent Beeson for uh, bringing this uh, forward. Former colleague of mine um, in the State Senate, uh, Senator Dick Cohen, would oftentimes say, with apologies, I make the following comments. And I'm not sure I apologize, and this may sound like a Friday morning homily, but um, just some observations, if I may, to uh, my colleagues as we deal with this issue that I think is extremely, extremely important. First of all, 12 of us have been duly elected by the legislature. We have fiduciary, trustee, governance responsibilities uh, given to us, granted to us by uh, the legislature. And the only time that the legislature, I might add, meets in joint convention. Something to think about. They meet for the hearing of the budget, but to actually take action. It's the only time. So the importance of uh, uh, regent selection is uh, very important. Uh, second of all, observations from a former chair and being here a few years. I have not a problem when we have disagreements of ideas. I love listening to different points of view from each and every one of you. Um, that does not mean that I dislike you or disrespect you for having, because I'll, I'll just, I'll cite you Regent Rocha, Regent Shu, sometimes Regent Simonson, others, Regent Swiggum. Um, I sit back and I think, now that's an interesting point of view. I should listen to that. 
An old newspaper publisher said to me many years ago, Dean, he said, let your detractors be your teachers. I've never forgot that saying because every one of us brings different experiences to this position as a region. Now, as we move forward, I think we have some opportunities. Opportunities as a board, but also as we start to broach the new presidency. I think it would be very, very smart for us to have discussions from a new president. What do you expect from us as a board? And for us to say, and we will, to the new president and the senior administration, what are the expectations? What are the boundaries? What are, what are things that are out of bounds, if you will? And maybe it's different for a new president as opposed to President Kaler, uh, different for uh, each and every one of us. The culture in 12 years has changed. Regent Cohen and I uh, know that. When we came on the board, it was pretty much expected that when the administration president made a proposal, we could discuss it, but when all said and done, it best be 12-0. It was told to me by other regents, it was told to me by folks who work for the region office, and I thought this is kind of different because I came out of a culture that if you had a seven to five vote, that was a good day, okay? If, so, if, you, if you're the seven. If you're the seven. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something like that. So, uh, despite some of the criticisms of this board and the fussing that we do, we have done some pretty good things. We have moved this university with President Kaler and his staff, but it's kind of that parking lot out behind the woodshed conversation that gets in the way, from my observation. One time, and forgive me for uh, lamenting here, one time in the state senate, we had too much carping going on, just too much. And finally, we called a caucus. Uh, Regent Swigum, you didn't even know about this, and that's fine. But yours truly said to the members of the Senate, if you have something to say to someone, don't come and tell me. Tell the person. Respectfully tell that person why you agree or disagree, what the problem is. And I think that works best in a mature, um, uh, active culture. And I'd like to see us, you know, move more in that direction. Can you formalize those things? Not necessarily. Um, the issue of a flow of information. All of us have different needs for information. Understand that. And how we respectfully use that information is also, you know, very important. Ultimately, I say, is it for the good of the order? If I make a request of uh, Mr. Steves or Ms. Dirksen to ask someone in this university, that is it for, for the good of the order. And I have to be honest uh, about that for, uh, for, for moving forward. Let me conclude with this. Uh, we have a huge responsibility of trusteeship for one of the greatest institutions in America. And how the 12 of us behave and act and present ourselves is extremely important. I'm not pointing my fingers at you. I'm pointing my fingers at myself. You know, how do I present the University of Minnesota back home or in the legislature or, or how, the, how I talk about it? It's very, it's very important, I think, because it is a good place and it's only gonna, it's only gonna get better. So to that, Mr. Chairman, Sometimes when we don't quite get our way, we sometimes, if we're on the uh, minority side of a vote, we then go and say something to someone else. And I'm of the belief that when we take the vote, we've done our best, it's over, and we move on. Uh, I think that's healthy for the organization. And maybe it's old school, but I still believe the president and the board chair ought to be able to, unless given the responsibilities by them that, that we should you know, present to the public our, our thoughts. Uh, I'm not trying to stifle debate or stifle creativity, but kind of a board, a board culture. Uh, I serve on two other boards, and every board has its own culture. You know that. You've been on different boards. This is a different board a 
of great of great importance. So uh, the public sometimes is critical of us, maybe the administration. Uh, we do our best for the betterment of this institution. So, Mr. Chairman, how we formalize some of these matters in discussion, I think, is extremely important going, going forward. And this is a time right now. We're at the cusp of perhaps three or four new regents, uh, perhaps, you know, a new president. And I think it would be a very good on, ongoing discussion as, uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Again, don't take this as being, you know, punitive or finger pointing, as I love all of your ideas ideas and discussion, debate and discourse. It's made this a better, better university. And uh, Dr. Kaler, you know, you have advanced many ideas. I know you get frustrated at us. I know that. But we still, we still have moved the university in a, in a good direction. We have some work to do in the board culture. I think we'll, we'll move in a good direction. And so Mr. Chairman and Regent Beeson, thank you. And I'd love to participate in you know, ongoing um, uh, matters of culture and expectations and ethics and and uh, so on and so forth. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with apologies for a Friday morning homily, I uh, conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Johnson. I, I appreciate and I know, I think I speak for others on the board in saying I appreciate the the long view that you provide. And, and, and I think that's somewhat of an issue that boards across the country have have been dealing with over the last decade or so with, with a, a change in a bit of approach. With respect to your specific point in the conversation um, that comes up to a vote, during the vote, and then potentially after the vote, I think that that will be a part of the conversation. I know the, the, the vice chair of this committee is, is dedicated to ensure that we have a full conversation about that so we do reach some some level of understanding, perhaps not perfect for everybody that's that, that's looking at. It. In fact, maybe nobody will be perfectly happy, but at least it will be something that that we as a board can can uh, move forward with and, and have a, at least a shared understanding of the expectations. Regent Cohen. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair, Chair Rocha. Um, well, I have a few points that that I think could be helpful as we begin to talk about this. First of all, I think a value statement is really important that we we ground what we're doing and what what we're more specifically saying in terms of rules uh, with a value statement. Uh, then I would like to see um, the staff and maybe a, an ad hoc committee of the board look at uh, some of these responsibilities that you suggested, General Counsel Peterson, the individual and the responsibilities of the board as a whole to make them more meaningful, more concise, uh, and <coughs> uh, to improve upon those. I'd also like to have us look at, <coughs> since we use Robert rules, is that an implicit statement that some of the Roberts rules of order do apply here or not uh, to figure that out? And then uh, with what Regent McMillan brought up in terms of remedies, I do think that we need to put a little uh, sort of meat it into some of our policy in terms of uh, ethical behavior. If we, if we think it's worth doing, then uh, I think that we need uh, to look at some remedies also. Um, and then uh, Regent Powell, I have a book, uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but it talks about boards, it's, and it's really good. I'll send you the name of that. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Regent Cohen. Uh, I understand, Regent Shu, you have a comment. We are starting to come up on time, but Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Chair Rocha. I just have a quick comment. As we as we talk about values, we've you know we've talked about this in the past, and uh, we do have another policy called the Code of Conduct um, that uh, actually has a section two guiding principles and subsection subdivision one is values. I'm not going to read them all, but I mean we do have a place currently where we do have a bunch of values listed. Um, maybe we need more, maybe we need less, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to reference the fact that um, there is another policy here that actually contains values. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Regent Spiga. Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, if I could, uh, uh, Mr. Steves, uh, or Doug, I'd like to go back, Mr. Peterson, to the uh, code of ethics, some uh, criteria you laid out there, and you, 
You mentioned the front page test. Yeah. Um, I'm written. Senator Johnson and I used to have colleagues that didn't care as long as they got their name in the paper, as long as it was spelled correctly. It didn't make <laughs> Good or bad, just spell the name correctly and we're okay with it, right? Um, I um, sometimes question the front page test. Not that I'm critical of um, newspapers or the press or what they write or what mm. bent they might have or not, but specifically that I was involved in one with the university here uh, about eight years ago. I had a question of conflict of interest of, of teaching at the Humphrey School. And a certain reporter um, might have been out to get me a little bit because she uh, reported that uh, we've got him now because he failed to put down his uh, economic, in his economic interest statement, the uh, financial dealings I got from the uh, Humphrey School. It was like $6,000 or something. Well, lo and behold, she wrote this front page article mm -hmm. Which seemed to be the truth, but when you get into it, you find out that you mean go to the economic interest filing statement says don't include any resources or resources from the university. Right, Brian? Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, I didn't include it. Sometimes the front page test is not always accurate. Sometimes the French page test is even misleading. Uh, is there anything you would want to mention about the front page test as we look at that as our ethics or our values? Uh, you know, and, and it doesn't happen often, but sometimes front page test is uh, absolutely wrong. Mr. Steves, do you care to render a response to the inquiry? Mr. Chair, not about Regent Swiggum's front page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, what I would say, I guess, is, is, and that's partly why we said it was unwritten. It, it, it runs throughout all of this. It's, it's, it's an attempt, I think, by the, by the body to protect, protect the whole group. From uh, from having instances where uh, where those kinds of of uh, of issues arise and are, are reported on, in your case, I think that the, the example you cite um, certainly there can be there can be mistakes made. There can be issues where you've you've accurately disclosed something uh, based on the rules that were outlined, and and yet the media has interpreted it a different way. And some of that is just um, unavoidable. I think. Mr. Peterson. Uh, Chair Rocha, uh, Regents Figum, um, I think your comments are um, very accurate and perceptive in terms of these kind of tests, kind of maybe putting the emphasis in the wrong place. You know, to me, um, maybe the, the point is that um, as one is kind of judging whether people are complying with rules, you need to take into account some of the intangibles and, you know, how will others read it from a fill in the blank val general values point of view, from a perception point of view, and not necessarily what a newspaper reporter thinks. That I don't think is the point. I think it's more you know, I can take my own sort of experience as a lawyer. I have often um, advised clients about how to work themselves out of a situation by the test of um, what would a jury think? I mean, if, if we had two weeks to sort of lay out for a jury all that's happened and and the manner in which somebody has conducted themselves and worked through something, um, would they come to the conclusion that it's been handled in a good faith fashion? So maybe that's a, a better test for me is what would a jury think, um, you know, if they knew all the facts, so if that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, Regent Spigum. I'm fine. You're fine? All right. Well, well, thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate the discussion. I um, kind of focusing. I, I'm looking at this a little bit more on a nuts and bolts basis, and, and all of a sudden a regent's retreat kind of broke out here this morning. <laughs> I was waiting to bring out some butcher block, but no, this is a very, very helpful discussion. Um, bringing things back to uh, where we are, I want to I want to thank. Um, Regent Beeson, um, it's been a lot of uh, fun working together over the last year and a half, and 
the fact that um, we, we sometimes come at issues with different perspectives because we kind of come at, at the position from different perspectives, um, it's helpful. It's very helpful because we have an opportunity to, to you know, seek to understand and then to communicate and, 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 and uh, talking about some of these things. As we talk about the, the policies themselves, and again, we have multiple policies, as Mr. Steves has identified, um, one of my considerations and one of the reasons why um, you know, we're here to talk about this with the full board is that Regents' policy really is the law of the university. And where things get a little unusual, and this goes to Mr. Peterson's conversation and your, your Regent Powell uh, in, in his experience with uh, the cultural questions, um, when you talk about the, the, the board regulating the board, it gets a little sketchy as to whether or not it actually constitutes law or whether it's strong suggestion or whether it's, you know, stated aspiration. Um, and, and, you know, from, from my, my biases, I like the policies to be as much of a sort of a functional law as possible and that and because otherwise you have some things in here where this is the region's policy on such and such, but if a, but if a regent is outside of that based on their sense of duty and loyalty and obligation and fiduciary perspective, there's really not a, there isn't a remedy nor should there be a remedy in that circumstance that we have to have that capacity to execute our, our uh, function as regents uh, to the best of our ability. And so um, those are some things that I think we're going to continue to, to speak about. We don't have enough time to really talk about specific instances and get into it at this point. Um, you know, I noticed that when, when you showed up the, um, showed the, the potential remedies under Robert's rules, one of the challenges, and this goes to Regent Cohen's uh, very apt point, is Robert's rules, you know, is the default to anything that isn't superseded by the Regent's policy. However, there are some things that supersede what Robert's can do, even though it's not specifically spelled out in policy. I noticed that we have a fining provision. Um, I have fined a number of you a percentage of your Regent income. Uh, uh, on, on numerous occasions, you just don't realize it. Um, but, you know, even expulsion, for instance, under Robert's rules, you certainly would run into some constitutional uh, problems with, uh, with our state uh, uh, constitution uh, were we to decide to, to, to expel somebody on two-thirds vote, particularly based on the reason. Um, that would be provided for that. So we, we do have some limitations, and these are things that we're going to continue uh, to talk about. I, I want to talk, just, I just want to make one, one comment. Um, you know, it, it, Regent Paul made some very, I, I think, some very insightful comments today. Um, I'm trying to reconcile, as you were speaking, the fact you talk about us versus a political body like the legislature. And you know, I have a hard time taking us from the political nature of the legislature all the way to the apolitical nature of a local and, and sort of self-sustaining nonprofit board. We're someplace in between. I mean, there is clearly there's you can have an impact of changes in in majorities, and you end up with people that have a different perspective to governance or a different perspective on the university. So I think those are things that we're always going to you know probably have to deal with as we go. Um, and, but but you know you you I think you frame the question in a very good way for us to sort of talk about how do we how do we fit within that, that continuum? Um, but your point is uh, talking about us as a team. Um, I think um, you, know, you, you rarely have teams where you, know, um, you, know, you, you wouldn't be put necessarily on a football team where half of the offense wants to run the wildcat and the other half wants to you know, do a wishbone. I mean, you know, so that's one of the challenges that we have is we all have the right to sort of have a different perspective. So how do we come up with a, a, a set, an understanding whether it's through policy or whether it's through another vehicle that, that the board creates for itself um, to allow us to operate as a team the best that we can. I'm concerned about focusing so much on, on as Regent Cohen was talking about, putting the teeth in the policy that, that gives you this enforcement uh, component. The way you approach those rules can really have a significant impact on your culture. You know, I, I look at a lot of the, of the challenges that we've had over the last several years um, and I don't necessarily think that they're inappropriate challenges. They're the challenges that come from a board of 12 people with different perspectives and different life experience. Um, and, and I'm just concerned that if we focus too much on remedy, um, it becomes, as I've described in the past, a circular firing squad, where you're, you're sort of strategically seeking to, to meet out um, uh, uh, frustration with someone who likely has a different perspective than you do on a specific public issue. Um, and that oftentimes the right remedy is probably about better communication. Governance in a body of distinct views is hard work. It's a lot of work. And sometimes it's 
understanding what that person is looking to do, what they need, what kind of information they need, and, and trusting that they're asking for that information or they're making their comments because they have a true belief uh, of, of that something's in the best interest of the institution. Um, I think that that, from my perspective, has a huge impact on, on our need to ever talk about issues like remedies, because I think that's got to be a very high threshold before you would ever seek to take action against a colleague. It can't simply be because there's a difference of opinion. And, and, that can, and that can be a difference of opinion even just on how, as a public figure, you have a role or responsibility to communicate your perspective. So um, we're out of time today. I appreciate uh, the very earnest um, attention and, and commentary. Um, Regent Beeson and I will continue to work with our remarkably able staff on this. I mean, it, it's really fun to work with the staff on everything that this committee brings forward. So um, Regent Powell, before we conclude. Well, just a clarification, uh, Chair Rocha. So, is the is the thought that um, that uh, the sec board secretary will work with general counsel to start? I mean, to develop uh, um, ideas on how to how to pursue this. Or, I, I guess the question is, what what is the the next step um, for how we're going to approach this work? There seems to be a lot of energy that we should do it, and so I'm just wondering exactly how we are going to do it. That's a, that's, a, that's a perfect question, Regent Paul, and the segue to our departing comment here. What I, as I expect it, and, and certainly we're you know, open to the guidance of all of our colleagues, um, and particularly the leadership of the board, uh, we're basically going to work on providing a target to start. You know, some, put something up on the wall so we can have that conversation. And so I think it's, gonna, it's likely going to be some sort of a consolidation and clarification of, of multiple policies that currently exist. There'll be a conversation about things, as Regent Beeson pointed out, that probably really don't belong in a specific policy of that nature. And then, you know, I, I've been at least envisioning having something that the board adopts for the board's own purpose. It wouldn't necessarily be for the law, the land, board policy, but something that rests in the board office. And when you become a member, this is a description of, of how the board operates and basic understandings and expectations. Not being sort of, um, you know, draconian and, and trying to direct how people would act and perform, but nonetheless just sort of trying to uh, describe a shared understanding of how we operate as a board. And, but, but certainly nothing will be put in place without a full uh, conversation of this board and, and people have an opportunity to um, talk about not only the form that we end up with, but the substance of what's in those, in those uh, materials. Does that respond to your question? Further questions or comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you.